So now we go right into the crisis in Galilee. This is all based on John chapter 6. By the way, thank you. That was a great rubric. Very well said. Now, John chapter 6, so much goodness here. And, and how do you read? I mean, can we really read all of this? Okay, I'll read some of it. So I'm going to start reading in John chapter 6, verse 22. So this is immediately after the walking on the sea. And this is one of the most incredible dialogues. And I just have to say this. John is ultra selective about what he includes in his gospel, even more so than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in my opinion. Maybe not Mark, because Mark's gospel is so short. But, but you think about the architecture of the gospel of John. We've talked a little bit about this. There's 21 chapters. And by the time we get to chapter 12, we're already in the last week of Jesus' life. So that's, that's the last 10 chapters of the last week of his life. So everything that comes before John chapter 12, um, highly selective, purposefully put in there, not just like, ah, yeah, throw that in too. The, the Gospel of John is a highly thought through, very well curated. These stories are in here for a reason. And John chapter six is one of the most extensive dialogues because there's all these great dialogues slash monologues in the Gospel of John. John chapter five, John chapter six, John chapter mm. eight, John chapter 10. And so when we come to something like this, something so unique, so incredible, there are lessons upon lessons upon lessons here. And Ellen White's chapter, for good reason, is long. It's long. So with all of that said, just feel this. I mean, John chapter 6, beginning in verse 22. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that, which, that one which the disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they had ate bread after the Lord had given them thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Why Capernaum? Because Jesus is always going to Capernaum. He has tremendous success in Capernaum, tremendous reception in Capernaum. So they go looking for him there, verse 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, hey, wh when did you come here? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. I love how they sort of set it up like it's this like happenstance encounter, like, oh, look, it's Jesus. They've been pursuing him, mm -hmm. right? They're chasing him down. They still want to make him mm -hmm. king. And they do this sort of like, you know, serendipitous, oh, look, oh, what, what are the chances? We just found Jesus here. And Jesus cuts right to the chase. I know why you're here. You ate the sandwiches yesterday, you want another sandwich today, and you want to make me king, okay? But he says, stop working so hard for the food that perishes. You're going to eat that food and die, and then that's going to segue into this incredible monologue, or dialogue that becomes a monologue. Verse 28, then they said to him, um, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? You've done some incredible miracles. We just saw one of them yesterday. How can we do this? Then Jesus answered and said to them, the this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat from heaven. Ooh, right? They're sort of setting him up. Hey, can you do better than Moses did? Jesus reads the situation perfectly. Verse 32, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the Bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. It's like the woman at the well. Give me this water so I don't have to come back here anymore. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. One of the seven I am statements in the gospel of John. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the father gives me will come to me. And him who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but that he should, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which has come down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, yeah, 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 I'm come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said, said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets that they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they're all dead. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give him, that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the Father has sent me so and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Might as well finish it up. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, whoa, this is a hard saying. Who can understand what this guy's talking about? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said that to them, does this offend you? What if then you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not yet believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered, them, answered them and said, did not I choose you, the 12, but one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him being one of the 12. Okay, I had to read the whole thing. Like, where do you stop that? Whoa, okay, 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 okay. So just in summary, what's going on here is Jesus has fed the people the day before. They've come up to him and pretended like it's this like serendipitous encounter, like this just random encounter. Jesus reads the situation. I know what's going on here. You had a sandwich, you want another sandwich, and you want me to be king. So you're pretty certain that they made sandwiches with the fish. Yeah, the I think they made sandwiches. They put the, the fish between the two bread pieces of bread. And then he says, why are you working so hard? This, this food, you're going to eat it and die. And then they said, yeah, well, that was only one day. I'm paraphrasing. That was only one day. You just fed us one day. I mean, Moses, you want to talk about a real prophet, mm -hmm. capital P prophet. Moses fed our fathers in the wilderness six days a week for 40 years. And then Jesus is like, yeah, about that. And then three times he says, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. They died, they died, they died. But if you believe in me, three times, I'll raise you up at the last day, I'll raise you up at the last day, I'll raise you up at the last day. And then Jesus turns the volume up. He's already said several offensive things. And then he says, my flesh, you have to eat my flesh. And then they're like, this guy's a crazy person. This sounds very non-Jewish. Eating flesh and drinking blood. It's like he's a cannibal. Right, what is he? This, this cannibalism. And when Jesus knows that they're offended and confused, he makes it even more intense and says, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed, and unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And then a high percentage of people that heard this crazy speech were like, peace out, we're gonzo. And yeah. they leave. They start just walking away in droves. So talk about a reversal of fortune. Thousands of people the day before ready to turn him into the king. Now, hundreds, perhaps thousands are walking away and saying, yeah, we don't know what's up with that guy, yeah. but he's definitely not the Messiah. Mm. They're now persuaded he's not the Messiah. I mean, they took his words as literally meaning he told us. I mean, I was there. You can hear people saying, I was there. He told us he wasn't the Messiah. Yeah. And then in this deeply painful moment where Jesus has sort of cold his followers, he turns to the disciples and says, hey, you guys also want to walk away? And Peter gives one of the great answers there, which we'll come to. Yeah, where would we go? Mm. Hey, you've got the words of eternal life. Where you would we go? You just skipped ahead like so many times. I know, I know, I know, I know. That That's a summary. Part. That's a summary. Okay. So, woo, we're in chapter 41. Indeed. You want to read us two paragraphs? 
Sure. Let's read those first two paragraphs. When Christ forbade the people to declare him king, he knew that a turning point, here it's another tipping point like we were talking about. He knew. Mm. He knew. She's going to say that again, so make that emphasis there. He knew. A turning point in his history was reached. Multitudes who desired to exalt him to the throne today would turn from him tomorrow. Whew. The disappointment of their selfish ambition would turn their love to hatred Whoa. and their praise to curses. Whoa. Yet knowing this, he took no knowing. measures. He took no measures to avert the crisis. From the first, he had held out to his followers no hope of earthly rewards. To one who came desiring to become his disciples, he had said, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. If men could have had the world with Christ, multitudes would have proffered him their allegiance, but mm. such service he could not accept. Of those now connected with him, there were many, this is a long paragraph, it is. Keep who going. had <laughs> been attracted by the hope of a worldly kingdom. These must be undeceived. Key the word. deep spiritual teaching in the miracles of the loaves had not been comprehended. This was to be made plain. And this new revelation would bring with it a closer test. Okay, that's the first paragraph. That's enough. You see what's happening here? Jesus was trying to teach them a lesson with the feeding of the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes. They hadn't comprehended it. That was the first test, his reluctance or his, his total unwillingness to be made king. And then she says, yeah, that was just the preamble to the bigger test, and the bigger test is going to be this incredibly difficult to understand speech that Jesus is about ready to give. Mm. I mean, talk about your ambitions being, you know, shattered on the rocks of a lack of expectation. Like, this is not what they're expecting or anticipating from Messiah. And Jesus knows this. Two times she says that. He knew what the consequence would be. He knew what the consequence would be. He knew that a crisis was coming and he made no efforts to avert the crisis. He didn't, he didn't switch up his words. He wasn't more careful with his words because he knew that a great many people were following him thinking and clinging still to a complete misunderstanding of what Messiah was and what the kingdom was. And so rather than sort of softening the language, uh, morphing the language to create sort of a dual meaning so that he could keep a large following, so he could keep all of his Instagram followers... He just set it straight and he knew that this was going to tilt toward his rejection. Mm -hmm. And it's not at all that he wanted, you know, to lose followers. He, he would have loved it if everyone still responded to him. Of course. But I think part of love is being authentic. And I think she brought that out at one point. Like, he needed them to know, right? Right. And I love that about Jesus. Like, he lets us know what we're getting into, right? He doesn't mm. pretend that it's something that it's not. Yeah, I really like the idea too. I'm moving on here. So they come to Jesus and they're like, hey, what? you did a really cool work yesterday. What can we do that we might work the works mm. of God? And, and this was so in keeping with their so social, cultural, religious context. Mm -hmm. Because remember the whole take my, yoke upon, you, you take my yoke upon you and learn from me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That was in contrast to these really strict rabbinical yokes of Jesus' time where like, the, the, the more strict and the harder to keep and the more fasting equated with holiness. And so she says now on page 444, 385 of the original, this is the paragraph that begins with Jesus did not gratify their curiosity. Or no, excuse me, the paragraph that begins from the moment, for the moment the interest of the hearers was awakened. Look at this section, just uh, about a sentence later. They had been performing many and burdensome works in order to recommend themselves to God, and they were ready to hear of any new observance which they could use to secure greater merit. That's how it worked. Mm -hmm. That's how it worked. It worked in Jesus' day that the rabbis would say, okay, do this, and the stricter and the harder and the more rigorous the observance, very much like medieval Catholicism, mm -hmm. the more pious that you were. And so they're like, what must we do that we can work the works of God? And what's Jesus' answer? It's the great answer of righteousness by faith. Mm. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. And then this sentence. This is one of my very favorite sentences. This is, this is it right here. In all of her writings. All of her writings. Say it at least. This sentence is worth the price of the book. The price of heaven is Jesus. Say it again. The price of heaven is Jesus. Jesus. Say it out loud right now. For those of you that are listening in, say it out loud with us. The price of heaven. You gotta say it with me. Sorry. Say it with me. The, the price, price of, of heaven, heaven is Jesus. Jesus. 
Woo! You cannot say that this woman did not understand the great truth of righteousness by faith. That's just one of the most concise, beautiful, easy to understand descriptions of the gospel ever. I just feel like I just want to sing the doxology over and over Please again. Please do, David. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Right? Like, do we even need to say any more? That's it. I That's think it. we could end here. We could end right there. Now, we probably won't, but we could. The price of heaven is Jesus. What do we do that we may work the works of God? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Ellen White's commentary on that? Oh, yeah. The price of heaven? It's Jesus. Mm. Okay, you talk for a while because I'm just over here worshiping. I'm just oh, doing my thing. Just a second. Oh, thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, one thing that jumped out to me in this chapter was um, Jesus's kind of posture of non-defensiveness. Mm. Like, he would contradict someone if it was useful, um, if he needed to correct a truth. But this turned into, like, an insult game. And I love how she brought out, um, there are certain things that Jesus wouldn't respond to. He wouldn't go there. He wouldn't defend himself. Um, and then she... Like said, his birth. Right. Yeah. Like, and I think there's a certain, um, the way we communicate people with people needs to be informed by the spirit that they're bringing to the conversation, right? Like, sometimes people are so against learning, so against being corrected, this chapter brought out, that there's no point in reasoning, there's no point in dialoguing. And I think that you really see that in the life of Jesus. Like, he tried to put his energy where it was the most useful. Yeah. And it wasn't about his ego. It wasn't about, like, I have to set this straight. Like, yeah, he said, you know... I'm the one that sent the manna when they credited Moses. But it, you don't see Jesus constantly getting into these power struggles that we get into. Like, I need the credit for that. Or, yeah. you know, that's not true. And I think that, I think it speaks a lot to his character. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Here again, we talked about this this afternoon. This is the story that no one could have invented. Yeah. You can't write this story. Because this is a totally different way of being human, mm. of doing life. And it would take a human being to write it. This had to have actually happened in order to have been recorded the way it was because there would be these little hints or taints of the fact that, yeah, 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 that's, he's like every other hero. But he's not. He just behaves yeah. in ways that are just radically dissimilar to the way that every other hero acts. He's the anti-hero. There's no one like him. He's uninventable. Mm -hmm. He's absolutely incredible. And there was this great point there just after that paragraph on the the believes, you know, believe the price of heaven is Jesus. They basically, I just wrote genie in the margin because it's like, you just get the sense that what they were looking for was a genie. Listen to this. Their dissatisfied hearts queried why, if Jesus could perform so many wondrous works as they had witnessed, could he not give health, strength, and riches mm -hmm. to all of his people? Oh, it would have been so easy. Yeah, to think why about. couldn't he free them from their oppressors and exalt them to power and honor? The fact that he claimed to be the sent of God and yet refused to be Israel's king was a mystery they could not fathom. His refusal was misinterpreted, and many concluded that he dared not assert his claims because he himself doubted as to his to the divine character of his mission. Mm. Talk about being misunderstood. Yeah. They basically are looking for a an Aladdin-like figure to just, you know, or I guess Aladdin is 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 Aladdin the name of the genie? Or is Aladdin the name of the person uh, that finds the, the person, genie? Yeah, the genie is just the genie. Okay. So they're looking for a genie-like figure to just do all the stuff for them that they want. So all they really want is an extension of their own selfish hearts. And when Jesus isn't that, they're disappointed in mm -hmm. him. It, this reminded wow. me, um, it's, we need to guard against this idea, if God really loved me, then this. Fill in the blank. If God really was loving. Because that's, I mean, the original lie in the garden, right? If God was really loving, he wouldn't restrict you from a tree. Great point. And here the disciples are thinking, oh, if Jesus really loved us, wouldn't he do this? Wouldn't he do that? And we need to, you know, reconcile our hearts with the fact that probably a lot of our expectations about life and how it's going to go are wrong, right? But we have to be radically committed to continue to believe in God's goodness, regardless of what happens. Like, do we really, really, really believe that God is good? And are we going to hold that thought even 
even when our senses are lying to us and even when our circumstances are falling apart. And at least what you say there is so crucial. Hold that thought. You have to keep that thought in the frame. God is good and my apprehension or misapprehension of what's happening right now cannot be leveraged on this. If God were good like I think he is, then he would mm -hmm. fill in the blank. No, God is good, period. God is good, full stop. And if I'm tempted in this moment to think that maybe my appearance, my sensation is that he's not acting good, the misunderstanding is on my part. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to keep trusting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sing the doxology, not again, but in those periods where it feels like that's not the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like the boat, right? Singing in the boat when it feels mm -hmm. like it's not the time to sing. Mm -hmm. um, I love the little Easter message in here. I thought that was very uh, Yeah, apropos. which paragraph? Um, let's see, we're How on does it the begin? beginning of 387. Most assuredly I say to you? Um, paragraph begins most assuredly I say to you? What's the paragraph? How does it begin? It begins, again, Christ appealed to those okay, stubborn hearts. Okay, I'll find hearts. it. It's, uh, oh, yeah. In, yeah, 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 yeah. Give us the Easter message. Well, it was talking about there's this controversy between the Pharisees and the Sadducees about, you know, is there an afterlife kind of thing. Yeah. And it just brings out this message of eating um, Jesus's, if, of eating Jesus, of Jesus being the bread, was really the message of resurrection. Yeah. Of the message of eternal life. And she said, no need, f um, no need for Pharisees and Sadducees to dispute concerning the future life. No longer need men mourn in hopeless grief over, over their, their dead. dead. Because he says it three times. I will raise him up. I will raise yeah. him up. I will raise him up. Yeah. I just thought that was cool that it falls on Easter. You know, Easter well, look weekend. at this. Jump ahead several paragraphs to the one that begins most assuredly I say to you, he who believes. Probably mm -hmm. five paragraphs. Did you find it? Um, most assuredly. It might even be all the way over there. Anyway, just read it. No, no, I want you to find it because it's but so cool. But they're waiting. Cool. Yeah, but that's okay. I can hear it when you say it. Most assuredly. But where is it? That's going to drive Most me. assuredly, it's right there. Okay, you read it here then. Look at this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Through the beloved John, who listened to these words, the Holy Spirit declared to the churches, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his mm, son. That's from John 17, 3, right? Well, First John chapter 5, but it's very similar. Okay. Yeah, um, this is eternal life that... That we would know him. Right, that's right. And then look at this. And Jesus said, I will raise him up at the last day. Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. Mm. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave. Yeah. Not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith, his life has become ours. That's powerful. That's that's an incredible thought. Like there was no way Jesus could stay in the tomb by virtue of the fact that his life was perfect. His and life was perfect. As we put Sin our had faith no rightful hold him, on him. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, his life His is life in becomes us. ours, so then we have to come out of the grave. Boom. Boom. I mean, right? Do you guys feel that? The point she's making there? It's it's not like God is bending the rules when he resurrects people. Through this incredible union of the eating the flesh and drink, in other words, taking Christ into yourself, she says, he became one with us in flesh, we become one with him in spirit. So when people who are believers go into the grave, when Christ calls them forth, they can't stay there because how does she say it? I mean, that line is so incredible. She says, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith, his life has become ours. Mm. Mm -hmm. That is some deep theology right there. Yeah. Almost like there's like a, a necessity in the same way that gravity does what it does or water does what it does or magnets do what they do. By nature of the thing, when we have eternal life right now here in the present tense, not just a quantity of years, but a quality of life, if and when we die and God says, yeah, it's time to come forth, that life is coming out of the grave because sin has no right. Death has no right. The grave has no right to keep that life. That's not your life. That's Jesus' life. He that has the Son has that life, the life of God. Mm. I, I've, I've literally never had this thought in my whole life. That's powerful. I've never had that thought in my whole life, and I've been a preacher of the gospel for two decades, and I've, I have a new thought on this now. Mm. <sighs> what a game changer. And by the way, one of the things she says over and over and over and over again in this chapter is everlasting life, eternal life, immortality, life, 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 life. I went through with a, with a can you see this? All this yep. pink, all this pink is every time she uses either everlasting life, eternal life, or some synonym thereof. 
That's what this chapter's about. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea that that's not just like a wink, wink, nod, nod, that God pulls a fast one. No, we receive. He became one with us in flesh. We become one with him in spirit. We are living the life of Christ. And therefore, we have eternal life. Mm -hmm. Not at some nondescript time in the future. Today. Mm -hmm. Today. Yeah, I think... (sighs) um, Primarily, when we think about the resurrection power, we think about Christ's power to raise us from the dead, you know, the fact that Christ was raised from the dead. But I love in Ephesians when Paul talks about, you know, the power of the Spirit working is the power of the resurrection. It's the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And then in chapter, I think it's 3, verse 20, Paul says, you know, through that power, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Yes. And so, you know, the life of Jesus... God honoring the life of Jesus in the resurrection, you know, for those who trust in Jesus, that's one element of it. But also, um, we are not just called to imitate Christ, but through the Holy Spirit, um, God sends resurrection power into our lives. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Christianity isn't a set of, you know, moral goals or moral rules to follow in our natural strength. Yes. But God connects us with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Because we have the very life of God in us. Mm -hmm. We've received, I mean, just a few paragraphs later, this is on page 449, 389 of the original. There's a paragraph that begins, are you a follower of Christ? Ooh, I found it right when you said that. Okay, read that paragraph and she makes the very same point again. Listen to this. Are you a follower of Christ? Then all that is written concerning the spiritual life is written for you. For you. And may be attained through uniting yourself to Jesus. Is your zeal languishing? Has your first love grown cold? Accept again of the proffered love of Christ. Eat of his flesh, drink of his blood, and you will become one with the Father and with the Son. One with the Father and the Son. You have the same life that the Father and the Son share. That's a divine life. When we ingest, when we take inside of ourselves... Jesus, when we inculcate, imbibe Jesus, we are one with the Father and the Son. Remember, that's the prayer of Jesus in John 17, that they might be one Mm, as we are one. We often think of one with one another, but one with us. Yeah. I absolutely love this idea. And, And again and again, you know, Ellen White actually, let me just jump ahead too. She has this paragraph where she just basically says, this is what Jesus meant. Okay, it's going actually... Just two paragraphs before that, to eat the flesh and drink the blood. This is how it begins. This is on page 449, same page. Listen, she just tells you what this means. So there needs to be no, you know, confusion or ambiguity about transubstantiation or what communion means or doesn't mean or the literal body and blood. She just tells you what it means. And it's so reasonable and sensible. One more thing. She says that this language of eating the law and partaking of the bread of God was already in circulation in the days. In other words, Jesus didn't just invent this. Mm. These were sayings like the take my yoke upon me was a rabbinical concept, a rabbinical saying. So what Jesus does here is he takes an existing idea and then he messiahs it. Mm -hmm. Right? I just turned messiah into a verb. He messiahs it. And in doing that, he's actually taking something that they already had in their common vernacular and parlance. And so people now, they come back and read that in in medieval Catholicism. They got this idea, oh, the literal body, the the Eucharist turns into the body of Jesus. And I was talking to a lovely lady, Carla, today in church, who's a former Catholic. And she said, I was a terrible Catholic. (laughs) I meet a lot of Catholics. Like I was a terrible Catholic. She said, I don't want to go to confession. I didn't want to do any of that. Now, There are a lot of millions and millions and millions and millions of sincere Catholic believers. Mm -hmm. But Catholic doctrine on the face of it is hard to believe. It's like really, really so like the idea of transubstantiation is you put the wafer into your mouth and when it's blessed by the priest and the mass sacrifice has been performed, you put the blood in your mouth. Well, the priest takes the blood, the wine, that it becomes the literal flesh of Jesus. It's the miracle of what's called transubstantiation changing of substance. Okay, no, that's not what's happening. That's not what scripture is teaching. Now, if you want to have some tradition within your church based on centuries of belief, okay, fine, that's up to you. But that's not what scripture is teaching. Not even close. And she here gives such a clear exposition of what Jesus actually meant. And I'm going to read it. To eat the flesh, do you have that? To eat the flesh and drink the blood? That yeah. paragraph? Why don't you read it? I lost it. 
<laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> a friend and to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as our personal savior, believing mm. that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him. It is by beholding his love, by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in, that we become partakers of his nature. What food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes a part of our being. So Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal savior. A theoretical knowledge will do us no good. Mm. We must feed upon him, receive him into the heart, so that his life, here it is again, his life becomes our life. His love, his grace must be assimilated. That's what it means. And she does an incredible job there. Mm -hmm. That is the chapter where she summarizes what it means to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You know, the word that comes to mind when I'm hearing you read that is just, like, it's something that's doable, right? Like... Un uh, what do you mean? Unpack that. Well, I mean, throughout the history... I'm going to go turn the light on, so just keep talking. Throughout the Christi history of Christendom, of religion, you know, people go on these long pilgrimages or, like, do really, really difficult things that seem so unattainable to become a holy person or... Um, but the kind of the plan of the gospel that Jesus gives us is a very doable plan. Like, okay, believe. you need to be nourished. You need to believe. You need to be in God's word. And it's something that helps people grow. But it's also something that can be incorporated into our daily habits. Like, it's, we don't have to become crazy. We don't have to do anything super, super difficult. Yeah, believing is something we all do. We, we've done it since we were really little children. Mm -hmm. It's just a part of the human experience. It comes so naturally and reflexively to us. Again and again, she'll make this point that if we don't resist the drawing power of Jesus, we will be drawn to him, mm -hmm. right? Belief is natural. All of us believe something about something. Mm -hmm. Today in your sermon, one of the things that you talked about was Martin Luther and how he involved himself in all of these really ascetic practices and rigorous practices in order to demonstrate, to prove his piety, his devotion, and to try and assuage the guilt that he felt. Mm -hmm. But then when he was walking up the Scala Sancta there, he, or you know, on his knees mm -hmm. going up the Scala Sancta, he realizes, wait a minute, the just shall live mm -hmm. by belief in Jesus. Mm -hmm. The just shall live by faith. And it changed everything. Right. And it, it literally changed not everything just for Martin Luther. It changed the whole trajectory of Western civilization and of the world. Mm -hmm. That one phrase, the just shall live by faith, is a, is a hinge for the whole of Western civilization. And that is not an exaggeration. Mm -hmm. I think there's a good point in here. And you know, we were talking in the last session about um, God's word being creative. And, yeah, yeah. you know, like in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, describing Jesus. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. Um, Jesus is called the Word. And when Jesus spoke, um, things were created. And so she's talking about here the creative potential of God's Word as we're feeding on God's Word. Because God's Word, we're not to, to think of Scripture as disconnected from the creative Word of Christ, right? Mm. Because all Scripture, you know, it says all Scripture is God-breathed. God-breathed. Right? So she says, um, as faith thus receives and assimilates the principles of truth, you know, in reference to reading God's Word, they become a part of the being and the motive power of the life. The Word of God received into the soul molds the thoughts, and enters into the development of character. So really, you know, we think of creation, fall. Um, we are living in a world post-fall. Mm. But when we come to Jesus, when we come to his word, it's like we're allowing him to speak in again. Oh, that's beautiful. It's like creation. Yeah. And the two words that she uses there are received and assimilated. That's the very thing that Jesus is referencing when he says, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have to receive it. You have to assimilate it. Mm -hmm. You have to inculcate it. You have to imbibe it. It has to become a part of you. And she actually says that. It becomes a, it becomes a part of the being. Mm -hmm. It becomes a part of us. And, and that point to me was the central point of this whole idea, this whole incredible dialogue, monologue that happens here with Jesus is that that... When you take my teachings, my life, my version of the kingdom, my version of messianic identity, and you inculcate this, you imbibe this, you receive this, you are taking my life into you, the mm. very life of God. 
And unlike the people in the wilderness, they ate Moses' bread. Sure, that's true. Fair point. They had bread six days a week, 40 years, but they all died. Mm -hmm. They all died. And then Jesus is like, but if you take this bread, you won't die. So that, that sandwich that you had yesterday was just a setup to let you know that the real bread that comes down from heaven is, he says it twice, I am the bread of life. I am, and the, the gospel of John is arranged around these seven I am sayings, right? So I am the good shepherd, and before Abraham was, I am, and here's one of them. I am the bread of life. If you take me, if I come into your life, well then, back to the point that we made earlier, if and when you die, when I call you forth at the last day, you'll come out because sin and death and the grave have no rightful hold on this life. Mm. Thank the Lord. And if that doesn't give us assurance. What could? I mean, uh, there's no like sort of, hmm, maybe we'll see how it works out. No, he says, you receive me, you receive me into your heart, into your life, I become a part of you. Then you will be raised at the mm -hmm. last day. You know what's super sad? Is even though Jesus here is describing some of the most beautiful spiritual principles and realities and like the most amazing experience available to human beings we're about to come to this tipping point where they're like, eh, Peace out. That's not what I was really going for. Yeah, no, that's right. And she actually says, um, remember back I had you, when you read that opening paragraph, two times emphasized that he knew. Mm -hmm. He knew. And so now when all the crowd starts going away, because listen, this is very important. She makes this point twice. When Jesus gave the answer that he gave here, this troublesome, difficult, hard to comprehend answer, they took that as Jesus saying, I'm not the Messiah. And Jesus wasn't saying that, mm -hmm. but through their lens of this sort of Davidic, Solomonic, military Messiah, you know, this majestic Messiah, they're like, oh, he's not the guy. He's an interesting miracle worker, but he says some highly offensive things. Did you hear what he said? What yeah. did he say? Oh, in a synagogue in Capernaum, you're not gonna believe this. He said you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And I mean, the Jews wouldn't even drink animal blood. They wouldn't eat meat with animal blood in it. So the idea of cannibalism was so revolting to them. And so they were like, yeah, peace out. And they leave. And Jesus has purposefully, provocatively said this in the strongest possible way, the most offensive way to purge away people that were following him for the wrong reasons. I mean, it would have been deeply painful for him to do this, but it was necessary to prune that branch off because Jesus' popularity was getting to a fever pitch, mm -hmm. and if he didn't quell it, he literally had to say this stuff in the way that he did in order to become unpopular. But he's not just going to become unpopular, he's going to be now regarded as blasphemous, as anti-Moses, and as dangerous, and needing mm. to be eventually exterminated, get gotten rid of. But I love how she brought out towards the end of this chapter, this decision was also protective um, because like we were talking about That's before, the, very the influence, end. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he was trying to protect his disciples um, by pruning out people who would undermine their faith and discourage them once things got more difficult. And knowing that the time would come when he would be lifted up, suspended between heaven and earth on the cross, that people would be leaving like crazy if they hadn't had a sort of opportunity to already get over a hurdle like that and and even in the midst of a difficult time, stay with Jesus, stand strong. They're also confused. We don't know where to go, Lord, but we're going to stay with you. They would have been absolutely devastated if they hadn't had these little mini trials to mm -hmm. set them up for the grand trial that was coming. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you're right. It was protective. Mm. Jesus is always looking forward, thinking about others. This is his precious cargo that was in that little boat, mm -hmm. right? He's got to protect them. So she goes on and starts describing, you know, their resistance to the message. She says... Um, let's see, this would be 392 in the original book. How does it begin? Who, Who's um, fan? Yeah, but halfway through that paragraph, she says, because they were too vain and self-righteous to receive reproof, too world-loving to accept a life of humility, many, many turned, turned away, away from, from Jesus. Jesus. And I, I many are still doing the same thing. Grieving, like, you know, she goes on just to explain, like, the whole way they thought about Jesus shifted. Right? Like they had just been thinking he's the hero, he's the guy, he's the messiah, and all of a sudden he's the enemy. Yeah. Why? Well, because um, because the message is hard. 
And it said... It was unexpected. Know, right. They left murmuring, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can hear this? And this reminds me of one of my very favorite C.S. Lewis quotes. He says... The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. Wow. Like if they were able to see that what seems hard, anything that seems hard about what God says, about what God commands, is much, much kinder than what seems to be the most kind thing a human being could say. I just saw my friend Roger Hernandez tweeted yesterday or the day before something like, if you think God is strict, try serving Satan. Mm. Right, that's what he's saying there, except he's yeah. saying man instead of Satan. Like, yeah, you think God is hard? Try the alternative. And that's really what happens with Peter when he speaks up and Jesus is like, are you guys gonna also go away? And Peter doesn't say, no, we're not going anywhere. No, 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 we're right with you, Jesus. They were similarly confused, similarly frustrated, similarly astonished at the things he was doing and saying, but they had spent, this is key, enough time with Jesus to know there's nowhere better than this. Like, mm -hmm. like we don't understand this. Mm -hmm. This doesn't make a lot of sense, but we've seen you, we've heard you, we've hung out with you, and we're super confused by this, but we're not going anywhere mm. because, listen to how she says this. This is quite funny. She actually says, um, she says, to whom shall we go? The teachers of Israel were slaves to formalism. The Pharisees and Sadducees were in constant contention. Now listen to this sentence. To leave Jesus was to fall among sticklers for rites and ceremonies and ambitious men who sought their own glory. What a great play on words there. To leave Jesus was to fall among sticklers, right? Like cactuses, cacti, little, you know, thistles for people that were just going to continually be poking and prodding about rites and ceremonies. And they're like, yeah, been there, done that. We know that's not the way. And while we are admittedly confused about the things you're doing and saying, and you're not fitting into the Messiah mold very nicely, you're the best restaurant in town. You're the mm -hmm. best show in town. We're not going anywhere. We have come to believe and to know, and I have a series of sermons that I preach on this, to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's not something that a human being can teach you. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's something that only Jesus can teach you. Today, Elise and her sermon... She talked about the evidences, the historical evidences for the resurrection. And she went down the sort of four points. So you have the, um, the early, what was the execution, early evidences, uh, help me. I always, eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts. Oh. There was one in there. Oh, the early, the early reports or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So there's four oh E's. I always do it as the four F's. Okay, what are your Right, F's? so you basically have fatal torment and then... Um, uh, I don't remember either. <laughs> I just put myself on the spot. But the idea is, is that there are historical evidences. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, fine. But even if you're like Lee Strobel or others that do this research, all you can get is a probability. All you can get is a historical probability. You can't prove that Jesus rose bodily, literally, historically from the dead. You can get, you can say, it's the best explanation. Right. It's the most plausible explanation. And if you're not going to believe in the resurrection, you have to find a plausible way to explain all of the evidence surrounding yeah. the yeah, story. Yeah, that, that's the point. But, 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 don't, but don't miss my point here, which is, yes, it's the most plausible of competing explanations. It possesses the greatest explanatory power, and many books have been written about this, and people like William Lane Craig and mm -hmm. Lee Strobel and others have, have done a great case. Mm -hmm. They've made a great case. Here's my point. All that can do is get you to 90%, 92%, 95%, 98%, 99%, whatever. The thing that we need is not just external evidence that strongly suggests that Jesus was the Messiah. We need the self-revelation of God mm -hmm. by his spirit to us mm -hmm. that says, Jesus is Messiah. And that's what Peter says. We have come to believe based on evidence and know based on the self-revelation of God in Christ. And we need the same thing. Belief based on external evidence and knowledge based on personal experience, the self-revelation of God by his spirit. So at least we can more than believe, we can know that Jesus is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Not 99.9, .9, not 99.99, one 100%. And here's the coolest thing about it. We can know it in such a way that we can know it for certain. Absolutely. But you could not demonstrate it to someone else's absolute satisfaction if they insisted on skepticism. 
If somebody wants to insist on skepticism, you're, and never conflate, never confuse the idea that you can know something for certain that you might not be able to show to someone else's satisfaction. There's a big difference between knowing and showing, right? Between knowledge and trying to provide evidence that can lead to belief. Mm. And this is what Peter says. Where are we going to go? We know you're the Messiah. It's very mm -hmm. much like Matthew 16. Who do people say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're one of the prophets. Who do you say I am? You are, he says the same thing, actually. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then what does Jesus say? No one taught you that. Mm -hmm. My father taught you that. God taught you that. And friends, you need to be taught by God. I need to be taught by God, by his spirit. Mm -hmm. I got fired up there. Sure did. Okay, can I say something that I'm excited about? Yes, of course. Should I try to talk as enthusiastically as you just do did? You, do your best. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> you okay. can't do it. Um, so I, I am enthusiastic. I just show it a little bit differently. No, I, I like your um, version of enthusiasm. So when I read this chapter, I think of cancel culture, right? Like we've okay. seen this heating up in the past year, um, especially just this increasing tendency for people to completely cancel one another. They said the wrong thing. They did the wrong thing. Right. There's no secular, there's no word for forgiveness in secular culture. If you did it, if you said it, even if it was a hundred years ago, sorry, you're canceled. Right. And so I think what's effectively happening here, you know, I was thinking like, what would this have been like if social media existed in the time of Jesus? Like, <laughs> I got to shut the door because I can hear people downstairs, like, but oh. All these angry mean sub tweets and people mocking one another. And certainly the disciples felt the intensity of this hatred. Like they're realizing, oh my goodness, we were the superstars yesterday when we're passing out the bread to everybody. Yeah, like we're they were the superstars. Canceled because Jesus is getting canceled. Jesus is getting canceled and so we're and so, like, canceled. This is their opportunity. Jesus is going to get canceled. Yeah, and this is their opportunity Whoa, to be like, oh, like I don't want to get canceled so I need to stop associating with him. Just like today, a lot of people are disassociating with people once that person gets canceled, right? And a lot of people are disassociating with Jesus because he's... Right. But it's not cool. This wasn't just on their part, you know, yeah, but we're going to stay in here because we believe there's a reward or we're going to stay in here because we believe it's the right thing. It says the disciples had found more peace and joy since they had accepted Christ than in all their previous lives. So despite the opposition, despite yes. the cancel culture, they were like, yes. this is where, where is that? love is. What paragraph that is that? Is, um, paragraph begins. To whom shall we go? It, to whom shall we go? That's on 393 of the original. The paragraph. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And keep going. What, where's the line at? Yeah, there it is. I got to underline that. Yeah. The disciples had found more peace and joy since they had accepted Christ, then in all of their previous lives, I can testify. Mm, testify. I'm t I can testify. Y yes, one a day with the Lord is better mm. than a thousand without him. It's better to be a, a, the keeper of the door in the house of the Lord than to dwell in tents of wickedness. Thank you, King David. Reach. Okay. The disciples, I'm underlining it, found so more I, peace. I just love this concept of, you know, we really can't sacrifice to be with Jesus. We can't sacrifice because he is the most valuable thing. Yes, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's, it's like Ellen White, you might remember in the book Steps to Christ, she has this great line where she says, this has always stuck with me. She says, what do we sacrifice when we give up all for Jesus? Mm. She's like a sin polluted heart for him to purify by mm. his own blood. And then she says, I'm ashamed to write it. I'm ashamed mm. to hear it spoken of. The idea that you gave up something for Jesus. What have you, you've given up nothing. Mm. I've given up nothing. The price of heaven is Jesus and heaven is cheap enough. Mm -hmm. Someone wrote, Jesus got canceled, but then he canceled death. Oh, <laughs> Oh, I like nice. it. He canceled the canceller. Woo! I love it. Man, God is so good. I, how did I miss that? The disciples had found more peace and joy since they'd accepted Christ than in all of their previous lives. Yeah, it's Ugh. not like they, they felt sorry for Jesus, so they decided to stick around even though everyone else was leaving. It's like they had never been loved like that before. They'd never been loved like that. Yeah. They'd never been accepted like that. They'd never been understood like that. They'd never lived like that. And now they're like, we can't go back. Mm. 
Mm. We don't understand this stuff that you're saying about drinking and eating. And this is all weird to us, but we can't go back. Mm. It'll make sense. Jesus will spend time with us. He'll sit down. He'll explain it to us. It's going to be okay. You know, I love the third to the last paragraph. Listen to this. While we cannot now comprehend the works and ways of God, we can discern mm. his great love, which underlies all of his dealings with mankind. I mean, that's it in a nutshell right there. I just wrote boom in the margin. You know, like it's the, it's the old saying, we, when we cannot trace his hand, we can trust his heart. Mm. When we can't trace his hand, we can trust his heart. I'm on fire. I'm happy. What was your word? Oh, let's see what everybody else's words were. Okay. This was a tough one for me. Really? Yeah, this was a tough one for me. Um, what were, okay, what were your words? What were your words here? Talk Let's see. Oh, hey, the Vanek family. Great to see you guys. Wow, that's fantastic. Oh, Diana? Yeah, of course. Um, Hi, Diana. Okay, assimilate. Oh, good word. Nourish. Nitro's always got good words. Doom? Oh, doom. Wow. You're going to have to explain that one, Sylvia. Mellifulous. One. Oh, that's a really good word. Word. Satiety. Deb Snyder throwing down the multisyllabic word. Word, bread, manna, very good, Hannah. Turning Christina point. Christina turning point. Relinquish, says Katie. Eternal, says Sue. Nourish, says Nitro again. Rejected by notorious JMW Juanita. Um, love you guys, says the van. Ah. Um, undeceived, great word. I, I, I circled that word as well. It wasn't my word, but that was an important word. Misinterpret, test, testing, satisfied, abide. I haven't seen my word yet. Cancel. Assimilate. Sue says, the nun 11 turn, IG Anderson, feed, rambler cat, trust, the humanity doctor, fullness, great word, Doreen Coleman, ooh, sup is an interesting one, rejected, uncanceled, says Wilkie Wendell, mm. I haven't seen my word yet, have you seen your word? Nope. What was your Seek, word? Seek, ingest, s true disciples, g oh, gift, great word, mm. okay, assurance, um, I haven't seen my word yet. These are all great. Life, yeah, life is a, yeah, life is a really, We're really, really good word. We're just gonna really have to wait word. here until someone guesses Price, your word. not my word, stay, no, but great, love it. Oh, two stays in a row there. Might, might, oh, might, might, like power, okay. Life, saver, mm. tel, titelestai, that must be a Greek word, indestructible, imbibe, great word, Megan. Um, prepare full word. Okay, I haven't seen mine yet. I, and to me, no offense, but I thought my word was by far the most obvious word. I thought everybody would have my word. I normally try to be a little tricky. Not tricky, but I try to look for something like the blind. Don't leave us in suspense any longer. Well, what was your word? Well, I want to know your word. But I think maybe we have the same word. What is your? What letter does yours start with? E. Mine too. What's the next letter? E. E. Then. Yeah, then what? T. No, not no. mine. Believe. Does so yours believe? Believe. Okay, that's not my word. What's your word? Better. Oh, be Jesus is better. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Stayed. No, Jesus is better. That's good. That's good. My word is believe because she uses it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole word. passage hinges on what must we do that we can work the works of God. This is the work of God that you believe yeah. on him whom he has sent. And then Jesus in that dialogue, monologue there, says over and over again, you have to believe, you have to believe, you have to believe. Let me just read you a few of them. That you believe in him. Um, he said, he shall never hunger. Who believes in me will never thirst. But he added, you have seen me, yet you do not believe. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Um, to eat the flesh and drink the son of, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal savior. Believing that he forgives our sins. Um, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that I, by believing in him, might not perish. He declared that we were to believe and act upon his teaching. Jesus said to them plainly, some of you do not yet believe. And then finally, also we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. The whole thing hinges on the central truth of righteousness by faith, that it's not by acts of righteousness that we do. It's not by acts of devotion or being a stickler for ceremonies and rites and rituals, it's by believing that we become one with Christ so that the life that's in us is a different kind of life. It's the life of God 
so that when the resurrection happens, we're coming out because the life of God cannot be contained, cannot be held by death or sin or the grave. Believe. Yours was better. Make the case. Mine was better than your word. <laughs> it, was, it was a very good word, but what better? Explain no, I thought it. believe was a great word. Well, when Peter says, where should we go? You know, where else would we yeah, go? Yeah, so you Can went really Jesus to the last better. little bit there. Yeah, yeah. okay. No, that's, that's a great one. You had your word more aptly described the overall theme of the chapter. The big, the big theme of the, the chapter. The big theme. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of great words in there. Somebody says believe and receive. Somebody else says happy anniversary. That's an unusual word. Now, that's an unusual phrase, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, oh, somebody says, believe in the better. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, I, like, I see nice. what you did there. What a peacemaker. A, 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 a peacemaker. Okay, let's go through your rubric, okay. and then we made it to the two-hour mark. I have to admit, I was kind of hoping we would. I didn't purposefully do that, but the pace has been great. Yeah. I mean, I just feel nonstop. We I'm, did five chapters in three days. We laughed. We, we laughed, cried. we, we, we laughed, cry. you cried. I didn't cry. You never cried? Not you cried today in your sermon a little bit. Yes, thank you. Yeah, just it's a little not... bit. <laughs> Has anyone cried on DA with DA? D got a little choked up at Aww. one point. Hey, have any of you guys cried when you're watching these? Yeah, that'd be good. No shame. I'm not, I, I wish I cried more. I'm starting to feel the, the temptation to cry more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's coming. I, I want to cry. My good friend Nathan Renner is a total crybaby. He cries all the time, and I'm actually really jealous of him. Mm. He can just tear up, and I'm like, how come I can't do that? Well, I have, before a sermon, sometimes lost a lot of sleep um, because I'm getting ready for the sermon. Yes, yes. So I'm yes. more likely to cry. Yes. Oh, that's so sweet. More likely to, yes. You're more likely to cry if you Oh, Michelle says, yes, totally. So... Before you preach, stay up all night and then preach and you'll be more likely to cry. To cry. And then people will Sandy be even says more yes. touched. Yes. That is so sweet. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, let's do the rubric. What was the point okay. of this chapter? I put, oh, I don't even like my point. I put, even when our senses lie to us, nothing is worth more than Jesus. I like that point, but I don't think it, encap it captures what you were saying. Yeah. No, to me, the point is... The price of heaven is Jesus. Yeah, that was the best point. The price of heaven is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Just keep saying that. That's that's worth tattooing. Get a tattoo, but not a literal tattoo on your skin. Tattoo that on your heart. The price of heaven is Jesus. Okay, what do we learn about the person of Jesus? That Jesus is the price of heaven. Yeah, that's true. Is that that was really? I put one? Jesus is irreplaceable. That's good. You know what I learned about the person of Jesus here? And I didn't write it down exactly this way, but I learned that Jesus was always looking ahead and making decisions in the here and now based on what was coming, not based on present opportunities mm -hmm. for popularity. He's always looking ahead. And, you know, I love that scene of Jesus urgently diffusing what would have been a crucial situation in the last chapter, you know, with like the the enthusiasm, we're going to make this guy the king. And Jesus is like, no, this isn't going to work. So mm. it would have been so easy for him to have been like, man, I want to get so many Instagram followers. I want to have so many people liking my Facebook posts. But he was like, no, 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 no. I mean, I got a different thing I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm responding to the audience, not the audience, mm. which I like. Beautiful. Okay. The prayer? Prayer. How do we pray this chapter? My prayer is I believe help my unbelief. Yeah. I've had that prayer before in, in the DA with DA challenge. Yeah, I think the prayer for me is, Father, teach me what it means to have Christ, to use Megan's word, how do I imbibe Christ? Mm. Teach me what it means to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man. I wanna know what that means. I want that to be a part of my life. I want that life. That, mm. that better life, that more abundant life. Oh, better. 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 And then practice. How do we practice this chapter? I think... You know what I think? Yeah. Um, no, but I want to. Okay, tell me. No, I want to know what you think. You have to oh, tell me. Oh, I think we have to be in the Word. Yes. I think we have to be in the Word more than in Netflix, more than on YouTube, more than in Instagram. I just think... I just think we have to be in the word. This is where Jesus is. At one point in here, Ellen White said in one of the chapters, the whole Bible is a manifestation of Jesus. 
-hmm. right? The Apostle Paul, what, 1 Corinthians chapter 120 or 2 Corinthians chapter 120, all of the promises of God are yes in Christ. And so I think we've got to prioritize scripture. The world is collectively losing its mind. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but the world that we live in is a world that would have been almost unimaginable 20 years ago. It's, a, it's a, even 10 years ago. Yeah. The world is collectively losing its mind and we need to be anchored to something. And I'm gonna be anchored to this. I'm not gonna be anchored to a politician. I'm not gonna be anchored to, anchored to public opinion. I'm not gonna be anchored to popularity or to fame. I wanna be anchored to scripture. And so that's how I'm going to practice it. That's, that's my practice. What's your mm -hmm. practice? Um, I think that the practical lesson for me is to, um, like, this question of if our work is to believe, how do we do that? And it's so easy to fall into that trap of um, thinking that we have a separate work. But our work is to believe. And we believe by continuing to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Like we need these reminders in our thoughts. We need to be saturating our minds with the reality of God's love and the gospel in order to keep our focus on Jesus. Got it. Okay, well, the word on the street is that Instagram has dropped out. So we've still got YouTube going strong and we're right at the end anyway. So why don't we... Close with prayer. Okay. You opened? Or did I, I opened. Open? So I'll close. It's your turn. Thank you for joining us for day 42 of DA with DA. Elise will not be with us tomorrow, oh, but... Um, <laughs> my eyes were so oh, We won't have DA with DA tomorrow, but on Monday, I'll be back. I just don't know the time yet, but stay tuned and we'll keep you posted on mm -hmm. Instagram and Twitter. And let's pray. Okay. Father in heaven, we want to live the life, the very life that you share with Jesus and the Spirit. Father, on this weekend, um, Easter weekend, we're thinking about resurrection. We're thinking about the promise that Jesus says that at the last day, I will raise him up. And Father, forgive us here, but we don't wanna wait until the last day to live the new life that you've created us to live. We wanna live that life in the here and now. Jesus promised, Father, that he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. And so Father, not just a quantity of years, but give us a quality of life. Father, teach us how to live that life that you designed us to live, to be fully human, fully engaged with you, and fully in service and in love to those around us. Father, that's a tall order, especially in an increasingly cynical, secular, sensual world. But Father, help us to love like Jesus loved and to live like Jesus lived is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. All right. God bless you all. Very. It's uh, so good to see you guys. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, Elise, for joining us. It was mm -hmm. great to have you. And if our paths cross over the next 40-ish days, you can come back on. Good to know. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.